behavior-driven design. What a unit test. I showed you what a unit test is. It's about validating a unit of functionality. It's about taking things, decomposing them into small things, into small parts, and validating whether each of these single parts works. Now, whether you do unit tests or not, I'm pretty sure every single person in this room has done a unit test in the past. I used to do them years and years ago as little hidden forms. I, when I used to write desktop applications, I used to do little hidden forms that would only be displayed when there was a big debug option compiled in. And that form would be displayed and it had buttons. Only button one, button two, button three, button four, button five. And each of those buttons would have a single or two lines of code associated with it, which was testing some algorithm, some routine, some method that I needed to test in isolation before plugging it in. That was doing unit testing. The problem was that as the form grew, I would reuse the buttons. And I wouldn't run those buttons individually each time. So I didn't have one of the benefits of unit testing, which is regression. So a unit test, it initially validates that the function or the method or the call you're doing is correct. And once you've done that, it then serves as a regression test. Because we know that it's about touching things that aren't related is when we break stuff. And unit testing is about catching those things that break. So it has already two purposes. Test driven development. How many of you have heard of that? How many of you know what it is? So test driven development is defined as, would you say this is an appropriate definition of test driven development, which is writing tests before writing the code. It's about writing tests before writing code. Is that a valid definition? Yeah? So I write the test before I write the code. It's test first, right? What is the true purpose of test driven development? Code that's testable. Code that's testable. Anything else? You want to do as much as needed to fulfill the test. Only do as much as needed to fulfill the test. So you're applying YAGNI, which stands for you ain't going to need it. That's true. It's not going to make that up. What else? You design the code the way you're going to use it. You design the code the way you want to use it. That's the key, most important thing about test-driven development. It's about design. The unit test you get is kind of like a side effect of that design. The only design things that I'm going to need is a side effect. That's not always applied, unfortunately. Right? You all know this tool over here, right? The balsamic guy. You know this one? It's a little tool that allows you to create user interfaces. Right? And you can show these user interfaces, these mockups, to your customer and say, this is what my screen will look like. Do you like it? And your customer will say, no, I don't. And you'll be happy and say, good, I didn't do any work. <laughs> what do you want to change? And you change things, and then you show it. Are you happy? Yes. You do the exact same design, and your customer says, I'm not happy. <laughs> this is about mocking up. It's about trying to give your customer the user experience, the feel of the application, before he uses it. How do you write classes? On a whiteboard? UML diagram? Just code? You just write out code when you write a class? You just start to type, right? We start to type a class. We start to type the methods. We pass parameters. And we've got our class ready. Then we go to a second class. Not in the case of the Google Analytics. He goes to a second method. But we go to a second class, and we start to create an instance of that class, and then we call a method, and we realize what? I need an extra parameter. Or the way I've actually called the method isn't very appropriate. I need to initialize the object. 
maybe I need to pass in some parameters when I create the constructor. And we evolve design. Because design always evolves. We hardly ever get it right. Even after 15 years of writing the method authenticate user, every time we write it, we think, is there a better way to do this? Right? Because design evolves. Software evolves through change of requirements, which is great because that means we get paid. And design evolves because we always find better ways to do things. So, if I take a mock-up of a user screen and say to my customer, this is how you would see your application when you run it. This is how you would interact with it. If we take that same concept and apply it to us, where we are a customer, and the product is a class, it would be great if we could see how we consume that class before we actually write it. Yeah? How could we do that? How could we call a method before writing the method? Well, we just write the line of code. And since we're focusing on a minor single functionality, we can call that a unit. And if we compile that and run it, we can call it a unit test. But the core concept of writing that test, the harness that the test provides us, is for us to try out the API of the class that we're writing. It's to try and define whether the way we are creating that class, whether we are calling the methods, what parameters we're passing in, how it's going to interact with other methods, those are the key things. It allows us to write testable code. Why? Because when I call that method of that class, and then I realize that that class internally is going to call a database, I start to think, huh, how am I going to do this from my test? So it gives us those hints. But the core concept behind test driven development is about designing a mock-up of our class and then implementing it. Now once we have that implemented, what we then gain is what? A unit test that is now a regression test. Which gives us the benefit that we can now refactor code. We can optimize it. We can try and see if there's a better way to solve it. We can try and see if there's a better way to implement it. And we have a safety net, which is that unit test, which will fail if we fail. So the unit test that initially started out as a mock-up for our design now takes on a different role, which is a regression test. That's the key thing of test-driven development. So what is BDD? <laughs> BDD is a second generation, outside in pool-based, multiple stakeholder, multiple scale, high automation, agile methodology. If there aren't enough buzzwords in that definition, I don't know where there is. <laughs> It describes a cycle of interactions with well-defined outputs resulting in the delivery of working, tested software that matters. Right? How many of you would agree with that definition of BDD? How many of you know what BDD is? Then it's really hard to disagree, isn't it? And it's really hard to disagree because you can't disagree with that definition because that's the guy that defined BDD. So it's really hard to say, no, that's not BDD. You might do something that might be BDD, but it's not how he defined BDD. So I used to do BDD, as he defined BDD, and then as I read more, I saw that there was a, there was a lot of uh, debate about different levels of BDD and different things of BDD and things like that, and I said, you know what? I don't do BDD anymore. I do my own BDD. Right? But I'll tell you what BDD is about, because the essence and the core of BDD is the key. And hopefully, after this session, you'll say, hmm, I didn't learn a thing. Because you'll say, but this, this is common sense. This is logical. Why would I not have thought of this before? Or well, even better, but this is already what I'm doing. That will be great. There are only two problems in software, and it is communication. I don't know who said that, but it's, it's a funny <coughs> joke. And if I have to explain that joke, then it's not funny. Everybody gets that joke, right? Okay. I want a list of invoices as a customer. And you, as a developer, will create a database table. 
The first thing you throw on that customer's desk is a paper that says the number of columns, the width, if it's a primary index, and what foreign constraints it has. And you say sign under the dotted line. What is this for? It's, it's called CYA. CYA, cover your backside. It's so that you then don't tell me, oh, no, 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 you asked for this. That's what you got, right? Of course, we solved that problem with Agile until we took code out of Agile. So we take a database, we create a database, we create a DAO, right, data access layer, and I hope today that nobody's still writing their own data access layer. We expose it to business services, we consume it from the user interface. That's the normal methodology, right? What do you want? I want a list of invoices. Here you go. We'll even use good practices. We will abide by single responsibility. We will do unit testing. We will have classes that say invoice style, invoice style test. And even though that invoice style test is in a project called tests, we will name it with the suffix test, and we will name every single method with the suffix te test as well. Of course, no one questions, why did we ever do that? Because it came from Java. And JUnit required methods to have the prefix test. <laughs> but we like to be explicit, even though it's completely done. But we write our unit tests. And when we do get invoices, we'll do get invoice test, get invoice list. Okay? Then you hand it over to the client, and it says, that's not what I wanted. Have you ever had this issue? <laughs> Right? So, but you said to me, I want to get a list of invoices. That's what you got. But that's not exactly what I meant. S stupid, stupid customers. They don't have a clue what they want. Oh, come on, we've all said that. The guy's an idiot. I swear, he's an idiot. He says, I want a list of invoices. I give him one. He says, it's not what I want. I mean, how stupid can you be? That's our justification, of course. Now, there's something important in that sentence. Can you tell me what it is? I'll give you a hint. Before the want. The color is red. It's the eye. It's got a laser pointing around it. It's the eye. Whose eye? My customer, of course. So I go to talk to my customer, who runs a pharmaceutical company, and he's a director. And he says, I want a list of invoices. Okay? And then I go and talk to the account department, and he says, I want a list of invoices. Okay? I go to the payment, and he says, I want a list of invoices. Okay? There you go. You got your list of invoices. But we pay little attention to the I. We just say, I is the customer. Yet... The director wants a list of invoices for one purpose. The sales wants a list of invoices for another purpose. And the secretary wants it for another purpose. Completely different purposes. But we try and encapsulate them all because we call it reusable code. Right? How many customers do you have? How many classes of type customer do you have in your code? One. I have a customer. And it's got four fields. And when Joe is implementing a feature for sales, needs a fifth field, what does he do? He slaps it onto my four fields. And then when Bob from payments wants a new field, what does he do? He slaps it onto mine. And now mine list of customers starts to go slow. Why? Because Bob's putting the whole list of payments. But we solved that problem as well, didn't we? We introduced this concept called lazy loading. <laughs> right? Of course, that gave us a different issue is, when do we lazy load and when do we eager load? But we solved that problem as well, didn't we? Oh no, we haven't, have we? <laughs> we now have concepts of lazy loading and eager loading surfacing into our business domain. Right? Because there's no such thing as one sole customer, just like there isn't one thing as a list of invoices. Invoices can have different purposes and be different based on the requirements. 
So the example that I give you is a far-fetched example of something that happened to me, which is I did this list of invoices, and I showed it to the customer, and it had a list of invoices in a grid. Why did I do a grid? Can anyone tell me why I did a grid? It's simple, because the application before mine had a grid. Why did they have a grid? Because before them, they had a grid. Right? Why did they have a grid? Because back then, it was the only way to search for things. You used to click on name, and then scroll down to the end, until you found the name you were looking for. That's all there was, grids. Of course, we brought grids into the 21st century, and we made them editable. Right? Because everybody knows that a customer wants to edit 50 records at the same time without giving any reason whatsoever. Just slap on a grid and tell him to do whatever. Oh, and he wants to capture intention. Fine, we'll add some logging. Why did you edit that record? Because I wanted to. So I gave him a grid and it showed a list of invoices and he said, I want a total. I said, okay, I'll go and add a new total. And I wrote it back and he said, I want status. You want status? Yes, I want to filter by status. Okay? So I went and added a filter status. He says, great. One more thing. What? Can you set it to pending by default? Right. But when you think about it, what the guy wanted was a number. He just wanted to see how much money is outstanding to be paid to him. But because he was accustomed to applications before that, and he said, I want a list of invoices, I just gave it to him. The only difference was that his application was running in a DOS window, mine was running in Windows. And it was a grid, a fancy grid. It looked nice, but it was doing exactly the same thing as his previous application was doing. And it wasn't my fault. Wait, it was. It wasn't his fault. Because he didn't know better. <laughs> but not because he didn't know what he wanted, he just didn't know if there are better ways to do things. Because he's been so accustomed to every application, the next guy coming in and saying, Oh, you want to revamp your software? Fine, let's just see what the old one does. The best thing when you do a rewrite of a system is throw the old one away. And start talking to your customers to see what they want. Don't base a rewrite on, a new, on an old system. Who is why? Who is I? Why do you want this? When do you want this? Under what conditions do you want this? Do we ask these questions? Or we just say, you want a list of invoices? Here's your list of invoices. It's not what you wanted. You're an idiot. You don't know what you want. No. And then we, you know, we don't take any blame for this. We're developers. We do what we're told. It's not our job to talk to the customer. We're antisocial. We're geeks. I wonder if communication over Facebook would work. Concepts are lost. I say to the customer, set Mark this invoice as paid, right? Make this customer preferred. What do you do? You take a class called customer, you create a method called set status, and you pass in an element which is preferred. What did you just lose there? The intention. Make customer preferred to set status preferred. The act of making customer preferred has been lost. You've replaced it with your own internal name. And of course, if you had the added disadvantage of not being able to talk to your customers directly, which I don't know if that's just a Spanish mentality or is worldwide, that some people are too important to talk to, so you have to go through layers, you get the Chinese whisper, which is, now it's really not what I wanted. So first of all, there's a mismatch between what the client wants and what the problem what the customer what he really gets. Okay, so think about that for a bit and let that settle in. Now let's look at something else. Dan North was teaching test driven development as well for many years, right? And he explained the same concept of TDD being about design. He was saying to his students, TDD is about design. It's not about testing, it's about design. It's about trying to design your class. So he would teach it and then he would say, right guys, Go write a method that starts with test and put some asserts in there. And he was finding that it's very difficult for certain people to grasp the concept that this is not so much about test 
and is in, as it is about design. So he thought, well, let me try and eliminate all those words that had to do with this the test, assertions, etc., from JUnit. Let me write a new framework, which was called JBehave, which focused around eliminating those words and focused around describing what the system was doing. When I get a list of invoices, it will return this information, that information, that information. It would be more explicit. It would talk about exactly what the context of the test was. Context, there's a key word. It starts to introduce the concept of context. So when I have get invoice list, I have absolutely nothing. All I have is a method that says get a list of invoices. I have no context. Who is getting a list of invoices? Under what conditions are they getting a list of invoices? The context has been lost. Somewhere at the same time, there's another guy called Eric Evans, who's written a very best-selling book called Domain Driven Design. Any of you read that? Right, it's a very, very thick book, quite boring, but it's a good book. And he talks about one concept in this book, which is the ubiquitous language, which is what I was talking about earlier. When a customer says to me, make customer preferred, when a customer says to me, make mark invoices pay, I don't write code that says in my class, make invoice pay. I don't write a method in my class which is make customer preferred. I write code in my class which is set status. And there we lose intention and there <coughs> we lose names and terminology that the business has introduced. And there is a mismatch. And what Derek Evans is talking about with the ubiquitous language is trying to use those same terms. And Dan North also at the same time took a look at this and said, hey, you know what? Maybe I should do that as well when I write these tests. Maybe I should be more explicit as well. We should add context. We should use the same terminology that we are using when we define the business. Maybe we should use the same terms, the same words. And stories were being defined like this. As a rule, I want a feature that provides some benefit. Now, when I work on a project, I have an Excel list, for instance, and I say, list of invoices, send emails. These are my tasks, right? Because I say, this is stupid. This is silly. Why should I write a story out like this? Why should I say, as me, I want to send emails so that Someone receives them. But this is key. Because this allows us to, write, to, to ask the right questions. Because the role, who is me? Who is the role? Who in my organization or my customer's organization is that guy? Because that can vary. Based on who he is, the result can vary. What is the feature? A list of invoices. Why? What benefit am I getting out of this? What is the business value that it's adding to my software to give you a list of invoices? What business value does it give you? Do you ask that question? Do you ask your customer, why do you want a list of invoices? Now when you do, this is the five whys. Why do you want a list of invoices? So that I see them. Why? Because I need to see the total. Why? Because I want to see how much money I'm on. So you don't want a list of invoices. You just want to see how much money you're owed. Yes. Why do you want a list of customers? Because why do you want a list of customers on a grid? Because I want to well, because the old program had it. Why? Because the one before that had it. Why? I don't know. 
right? And then we say, hey, we don't need that feature. And believe it or not, dropping grids from applications make them a whole lot simpler. So the five whys and asking questions like this with this format allows us to see exactly what it is, what feature it is that we're adding to the business that provides value. It's about applying Yagni, right? It's about only writing code that matters. It's about only implementing features that matter. Now these stories start to give way to scenarios. So if I describe my story as a user, I want to log in so that I can buy tickets. So we can take the customer that is describing the story and we can sit him down with us, the developer, and we can sit him down with another user of the system, and we can sit him down with testers, and we can sit him down with QAs. And we all sit down and we say, right, so this is a feature. Let's think of everything that could happen in this feature. As a user, I want to buy I want to log in so that I can buy tickets. So when I come to log in, what can happen? Well, if I have a login page, when I provide credentials, it can be valid and it will redirect me to the home page. If I have a login page and I provide invalid credentials, it will display an error message. If I'm on a login page and I type in 3,000 characters, it will throw a stack overflow. Those are the test guys, those are the QA guys that come up with those edge scenarios, which are good. And those edge scenarios, you know why they're good? Because they also tell us whether that edge scenario is a business problem we have to solve or not. Is it something we need to test that describes a new business scenario? Or is it something that I've been doing this for about six months and I refuse to restart? It's just my way of imposing myself over windows until it crashes. So, it's about asking the right questions to see if from one feature we actually don't even have a feature, but we have multiple features. So what has this got to do with TDD and BDD and all that? Well, we'll see. The given when then. If we talk about scenarios, given the login page, when I provide valid credentials, I am redirected to pay to purchases. What am I doing in the given? I'm setting up a scenario. I'm saying given a series of things, I describe that scenario very well. I make no assumptions, because no assumptions is a good thing. Because assumptions are the root of all evil. The assumptions are, this is why the customer didn't get what he really wanted. Because I assume he wanted this. Because I didn't write ask the right questions. So I ne never, never, never make assumptions. Because assumptions are those hidden things that suddenly start to surface in that scenario I'm trying to describe. And those hidden things that start to surface are important for that scenario and for that feature. When I perform an action, I describe what I'm doing as a user to the system. When I log in, then I say what the system does. Okay? So given when then, given when then, when, given the login page, when I provide the valid credentials, I'm redirected to purchases. Given, set up a scenario. When, perform an action. Then, something could happen. Can somebody tell me what this starts to look like? the triple A in a unit test. Arrange, act, assert. So now, I can describe my scenarios as what? As tests. What is my scenario describing? It's describing one of N scenarios of what? Of a feature. When I have all those scenarios completed, I have the feature completed. Therefore, what exactly is it that I'm describing in my tests? I'm describing features. What is a feature? It's part of the program. It's part of the specification. What am I defining in my test? I'm defining the specification of the system. The documentation. 
the Word document that we all write, that we get the customer to sign, and that it's obsolete the moment we start working on the program. We all write that specification. Nobody goes back and updates it. You might, during the first month, you might want to keep things in sync, but on a six-month project, the last thing you're going to do when you deploy is say, right, now let me examine the code and go and update the Word document so that the specification matches exactly the code. We don't do that. Why? Because it's not staring us in the face. Whereas if we're describing the specification, the features, the scenarios with code, it is staring us in the face. If a feature changes, we will change it in our code. Because the last thing we want to do is run a test that fails and the code that it's implementing has nothing to do with what the test is describing. It hurts. It's wrong and we fix it. It's like calling a method something and it doing something completely different. So we have ubiquitous language, which is eliminating the communication mismatch between customers and their developers. We have eliminating testing terms from frameworks. Having compiled specification, that is specification that you can actually compile, right? We have focusing on business value. We are asking the right questions. We are saying, why do you need this feature? And we are defining these specifications during these sit-downs with our customers. And if we throw all that into one bowl, that's what we're trying to accomplish with BDD. So when you think about it, it is nothing more than using tests as functional, compilable specifications, but not limiting it to creating cryptic computer terminology, but using test names to describe context, to describe business value, to describe the actions that we're performing. And that gives us something else apart from validating functionality. It now gives us documentation and specification of the system. So those of you that say unit tests no longer, you know, they're not that important because I write bug-free code every single time, apart from needing help, you see that now unit tests are not only about validating things working, they are not only about having a regression test, but they're also about specification. It's about specifying my system. It's about getting rid of that Word document and using code to describe my system. How can I do this today? It doesn't matter what you do today. BDD is not about tools. If you use, if you do unit testing today, you use MS test, stop. If you use N unit, X unit, MB unit, J unit, all of these are fine. They're all great. They all work. So, does it matter what tool I use? No and yes. No, because the concept of BDD is about communication. It's about describing things. It's about talking to the customer. It's about adding business value. It's not about the tool. However, the tool does help in that communication. It does eliminate some of the barriers that certain tools impose. Like, for example, the problem Dan North had, which was JUnit had too many words and terminology focused around testability. And JBehave eliminated that. So, you can use a whole bunch of tools. I'm going to show you two examples. One is with MSpec, and one is with Specflow. How many of you use Specflow? How many of you use MSpec? That's even. One guy uses Specflow, one guy uses MSpec. <laughs> well, I use MSpec, so that's two. We win. Okay? So what is Specflow? So there is a... Everyone here is a .NET developer, right? No Java guys, no? Any Ruby? Right. So there is a there is a tool in Ruby. You've heard of Ruby though, right? Okay. There is a tool in Ruby which is called Cucumber. And Cucumber is a way for us to describe tests like this. 
to go down to here, or I won't say tests anymore, I'll say specifications. <coughs> Don't you just love PowerPoint? Why not from the slide I am at currently? It allows you to define features like this, and it produces compilable, although in Ruby there's no such thing as compilable, but it produces code, it produces Ruby code, okay? Now the language that it uses to describe this, you think cucumber's funny, the language is called gherkin. <laughs> that salty stuff you put in your sandwiches, right? So specflow is a port of <laughs> cucumber and gherkin to .NET. You don't have to actually use, you can use Cucumber directly via <coughs> another thing, which is another uh, project, which is called Cute for Nuke. And then they say the developers aren't weird. Cube for Nuke is like a socket server that listens and it is an interpret. It's a it's a it's a pipeline between Ruby and .NET. So if you want to use Cucumber, you can with Cube for Nuke. If you don't want to use Cube for Nuke, you can use Specflow. And there's others. Everyone now is inventing their own framework. Okay? It's not about the framework or the tools. It's about the concepts. So here I have an ASP.NET MVC application, right? And I have the default templates. And when you install Specflow inside Visual Studio, what it gives you is a bunch of add-ins, and it gives you some file templates, etc. So you can now go to File, New, and actually it wouldn't be File New, let's go right click, Add, New Item, and you see that I have a Specflow Event Definition, Specflow Feature File, and Specflow Step Definition. Okay? So when I add a specflow feature file, what I get is this. It's a, you see that it has syntax highlighted. Okay? So basically it's taking the same image as I have here and using that to describe it in code. Okay? So here's one I have from earlier. Logging. The feature I'm about to implement is called logging. In order to access the system, as a user, I want to log in. So that would be equivalent to this top box over here. Right? And then that top box gives way, in my case, to two scenarios. Valid credentials. Given I provide a valid username and password, I pre when I press login, then I should be redirected to home page. Now Cucumber has support for AND. And this guy does too. This already tells us one thing that in a normal unit test, I could, I normally, they say a best practice is to what? To only test for one thing. With BDD, when you're describing a system, often you can't decompose it into individual parts. Why? Because BDD is about outside in. <laughs> it's about taking the system and describing it first from top down, from the user interface. Okay? So here I'm describing the user interface. And if my user interface, when I log in, has to redirect to the home page and send an email, I need to capture that in my scenario. I need to capture that in my feature. Because otherwise, I'm not conforming to the specifications of the system. Okay? Now, scenario is invalid credentials. Given I provide an invalid username or password, when I press login, then I should be then I should then I should be displayed a message indicating invalid credentials. Those are my two scenarios. Now if we run this, I hook this up to I hooked this up to N unit, which is not hooked up anymore, but this runs inside the N unit console. Okay? And it will say to me, this is all not implemented. So the next thing I need to do is now implement this, because all this is it's doing is describing the feature and the scenarios, but there is no code. How do I, as a developer, now use this so that I can compile this and implement it and validate the functionality? That's 
And spec flow, you use what's called the steps. So the steps are a arrange a certain act. So I have a class which is called login valid steps. So you see that a step corresponds to a scenario, not a feature, right? And then I have the given, the when, and the then. This is for regular expression matching. Basically what it does is that when this runs, it checks to see that this part matches exactly the line that's been written in the scenario. Because if it doesn't, what does that indicate? That the scenario is describing one thing and the test is doing something else. It generates this for you automatically. When you run this code, when you run, basically you set up a login feature, you, you set up a feature, describe the scenario, hit run, and it will spit out some C-sharp code saying that these steps aren't implemented. The normal flow is to copy that and create a login steps file. And then you fill in the blanks. And that's great until you need to modify the feature. Because then either you've got to overwrite it or manually come and update the expressions. Okay? So that's a gotcha you've got to watch out for. But all I'm doing here really is just arrange act and assert. See the similarity between this and a unit test? Arrange, act, assert. The difference here is, however, that I'm using business terms, UI interface term, to describe the system. And now I have a functional specification, which I can compile and I can run, and it can tell me if it's passed or it's failed. By default, it sets up context, scenario, current, pending, which means that when you run this, some test runners will give you a yellow, others will give you a red saying that this isn't implemented. Okay? That's spec flow. Now, when you show this to people, they like this. Do you like this? Yeah. Right? So, now don't fall in the trap of saying, oh, you know, my world just opened up. Now I will just tell my customer to write features like this, <laughs> give them to me, and I implement it. The key in BDD is questions, is communications, is asking why. If your customer is going to hand you the features for you to implement, then you're just what? A lazy program. Right? With the same problem you had before, which is miscommunication. So don't ever look at spec flow or see that as an advantage. Okay? The disadvantage to spec flow is that, that as you change things, you need to update things. And personally, I don't like it. Don't know why. I don't like lamb burgers either. I like lamb leg, but not lamb burgers. That's too much information. <coughs> we don't care. So this one is what I use, right? And this is called MSpec. And MSpec uses lambda expressions. Hold on, let me just switch something on so you don't see that. So MSpec uses lambda expressions. And if you look at it, we have it established because it. Again, what do we have? Arrange, act, assert. In this case, I use the class name to describe the context and the action I'm taking. So I do, when entering a valid username and password, the assert, the then, is the it. It should go to homepage. And I could say, it should send email. So this is the same as the equivalent of the AND in SpecFlow. What is the advantage to AND spec over SpecFlow? Well, first of all, it's self-contained. There is no 
feature file and then the generated code which then you have to manually update if something changes. It's also, personally I feel that this is more readable than seeing attributes enclosed in, in square brackets spread out between three different methods in a class, right? You get past the lambda expressions. Those become blind to you, you don't see them. All you focus on is when entering a valid username and password, it should go to home page and it should send an email. Right? What this does is when you run this, and you can run this from the command line, it's got a runner if you're using ReSharper, and if you see, what it does, it removes the underscores. Right? So authenticating, when entering a valid username and password, it should go to the home page and it should send an email. And that you can print out as HTML, for instance. It has an option to print it out as HTML. You give that to your customer. And you say, this is what we talked about. This is what I have currently in the system. Do you like it? Is this what we agreed on? And your customer can see, it nicely tells him also which things aren't yet done. Right? So you can just say, this is the functional specification. When I finish the application, I have a fully functional specification that I can nicely print out if I want to. Right? So, again, it's not about the tool. It's just about describing behavior, describing context, describing it in terms that the user understands. Right? So here's a couple of things when you start doing BDD. First of all, let me show you. This is, this is a test project, right? That's using MSpec, okay? And MSpec also has the option to output things into TeamCity. TeamCity is a continuous integration server, right? So it outputs it, and this is what you get. You get a nice format of all your specifications. And you can see them all, right? So if you're using TC or you're trying to integrate with any CI server, you can have that. Okay? So that works also. Now, here's a couple of gotchas when you start with this. Whether it's SpecFlow or whether it's MSpec or whatever. One question that sometimes people have is, this is outside in. So I'm starting to describe my features of my application from outside inwards. So when I start, I don't say, right, I'm going to create a business data access layer, I'm going to create a customer table, I'm going to create a customer DAO, and I'm going to create a customer invoice layer. No, I say, what do you want? And from outside, I start to drive out the features. So here, I'm creating a login page. Once I finish this login page, the next step is what? to now create all the components that interact with that login page, which could be authentication components, which could be data access components. So one of the distinctions which I say now is why I diverge from the formal or the practiced BDD is that they say that this is great for what this is kind of called the acceptance test, which I think is ironic. Because test for me should always pass. Acceptance is, you know, it's redundant there. But they say, use this when you're talking to your business, when you're talking to your customer. And when you go down to lower levels, when I'm talking repositories, when I'm talking logging, when I'm talking authentication services, let's go back to traditional N unit or MS test or X unit and use normal unit testing. Right? So we can do BDD and TDD. Except for me, TDD and BDD is exactly the same. It's just done right. But people say, no, I do BDD for here, I do TDD for here, I use NSpec for this, and I use NUnit for this. What am I gaining by using the concepts behind what we've explained today? I'm gaining context, I'm gaining insight, I'm gaining documentation. Right? which is great for my business, which is great for my customer, that he understands. Because we're talking user interface. 
Now let's drill down to the repository. Okay? Drill down to the repository. Who is my customer at the repository level? Who's going to consume the repository? Who's the user interface or the user of the UI of the repository? Myself or my teammate. Right? What is bad about adding context and being explicit and describing things fully at a lower level? What? As developers, we're more intelligent than normal human beings? Well, we are. Right? <laughs> Doesn't matter. What is, the, what is the problem with that? There is no problem, right? Is it too explicit? Yeah, I mean, you imagine that I write a test that says, when I have given a customer repository and an underlying database, when I call get customers, it should return a list of customers. And you're thinking, i got to write all that? Yes. Because you know what a repository is. Right? It's been beaten to death. Same as authentication services. Do you know what a program structure interface is? No, you shouldn't, unless you're writing ReSharper plugins. I didn't know what it was. And if they had described to me that when you call get components on the PSI class, it gives me a list of components that are active in the system and belong to a specific solution component, that would have helped me. But the test just said, get components. <coughs> what do we have to go on when we're talking about tests to see if they're valid? Have you, do you know what code coverage is? Code coverage is, what percentage of my tests cover the code base? And they say code coverage is crap. You don't need code coverage. 100% code coverage doesn't mean anything. Of course it doesn't. I can have 100% code coverage and still have the wrong tests. Because I didn't understand the customer. How can I validate that the code I've written in a test really is what the customer wanted? By being explicit in the test. By establishing context, naming things correctly. Because that's the only thing I have to go on to validate that the code I'm writing is what the test is saying it's doing. And if the test, what it's saying it's doing, is describing the business behavior or the requirements, then that's what is valid for me to know that I'm doing things right. So, you don't need to use different frameworks at different levels. Yes, sometimes it's a little bit too explicit and you might think it's redundant, but it's only redundant for you. There are people that don't know what a repository pattern is. There are people that don't know what an active record pattern is. There are people that don't know what a singleton is. All you're doing is helping them understand those concepts. And when you come back to your code in eight months or in two years, and you have forgotten those domain-specific concepts of your code, it's going to help you. The other question that arises is, is this about integration tests? Is this about... Do I no longer need to use mocks? Are you familiar with mocks? You'll find out later a little bit more into mocks. And no, it's got nothing to do with that. In fact, mocks are very important here. Because when I'm writing, imagine that I start to write this test and I say, when logging in to the home controller, given a username and a password, it should go to the home page. Now I have a dependency which is an external authentication system. And that external authentication system eventually needs to be implemented. When do I do it? Should I now stop focusing on this test, on this specification, and now write up a specification for authentication services, and then implement that? And when I get to that, when that needs to talk to the database, should I stop that and move over to the database? No, because we switch context, and switching context is not really productive, it breaks the flow. So what we do do is use mocks to stop our behavior, complete one specification, finish it, and then drop down to a different one, and move on from there. Okay? On my, on GitHub, if you know about GitHub, 
both on my repository as well as others, there's a lot of people using MSpec. Some are using it correctly, some aren't using it that correctly. But the important thing is that most of them are adding context. What is important <coughs> about MSpec is that when I read this line, when I read this guy over here, I need to know exactly what context I have so that I can validate the context that it's describing here with the context that it's establishing in code. Right? So if I'm setting up an underlying database, I better describe it up there. Some people use this to say, given valid database, for instance, to add value to the context there. This should tell me exactly what the code is doing. Normally, each it, a good practice is to only have one assertion per it. Sometimes it's not possible because we have to do implicit typecasting, etc. But normally it's good practice to have one assertion per it. If one action does multiple things, each of those will go in its own it statement. Okay? So. To sum up, it's about improving communication and understanding. That's the key things to BDD. And it's about delivering better software. Let's go back to the definition. BDD is second generation, okay, because he says so. Outside in, why? Because I'm starting from the outside features. I'm driving my design from the UI down to the individual components inside. Pool based. Pull based because it's based on the features that we want, on the business value that it adds. Multiple stakeholder. Why? Because multiple people intervene in the process. There's the developers, there's QA, there's customers. High automation because it's automated. And what's the most important thing is because we write, ask the right questions, because there's good communication, because we are describing things correctly, or to the best of our knowledge, we try and deliver software that matters. It's not about the tool, it's about the communication and about doing things right. So, that's the formal definition. My definition is just that, doing things correctly. Okay? Which is just common sense. Any questions? I'm done, thank you.